In reading Kate Clifford Larson's new book, Rosemary, The Hidden Kennedy Daughter, I was struck by an observation from Sister Margaret Ann, one of the caregivers in the later years in Wisconsin, that Rosemary had a magnetic personality. As others before us, we too are drawn to the story, perhaps like Greeks attending a theatrical tragedy. We know in advance the tragic ending to come and watch the actions of two of our protagonists. First, Rose Kennedy and her tireless efforts to educate and protect her eldest daughter, and later Joe, the patriarch, in his unending search for a cure that would not come, and then for the right placement where his beloved Rosemary could grow and feel productive. She was born in an age when intellectually challenged and learning disabled children had few options, bleak educational opportunities, and limited prospects to lead independent lives. Joseph B. Kennedy was, if anything, obsessively protective of his children, so fearful that one of his sons might die should the U.S. go to war in Europe, he did everything in his power, including disobeying the very president who appointed him ambassador, to prevent the outbreak of World War II. His greatest fears would come true, of course, losing his firstborn son, Joe Jr., and a few months later, his war-widowed daughter, Kathleen. Rosemary might also be considered a victim of that war, for the one setting where she most flourished was under the care of Mother Isabel of the Assumption Sisters at Belmont House outside of London, which Joe described in a letter to his wife as providing, quote, the ideal life for Rosemary. The school used the Montessori method, and since Rosemary was older than the other students, she served as Mother Isabel's kindly assistant. About this time, Kate Larson notes, Rosemary's favorite story to read to younger children was Winnie the Pooh, one of the few books she could read with confidence. But as the storm clouds of World War grew, Rosemary pleaded with her father not to move her from Belmont House. Yet thinking he was protecting her safety, he chose to send her back to rejoin the rest of their family in the United States, much as a few years hence, he would make a similarly fateful medical decision. If we know the contours of this saga, Kate Larson unveils them to us in a refreshing manner. Trained as a historian and the author of three books, including a biography of Harriet Tubman, she's the first biographer to have access to many of Rosemary's letters, as well as newly released family materials here at the Kennedy Library. The New York Times describes this volume as, quote, a valuable account of a mental health tragedy and an influential family's belated efforts to make amends. The book is on sale in our bookstore, and there'll be a book signing following the forum. Our moderator this afternoon, Eileen McNamara, is a professor of journalism at Brandeis University. A former Boston Globe columnist, she won the 1997 Pulitzer Prize for commentary only 18 months after she began writing her twice weekly column. She became a columnist after more than 20 years as a reporter covering everything from the night police beat to the United States Congress. As a sign of the times in which she lived and the challenges she overcame, it should be noted that she began her career at the Globe as a newsroom secretary. <laughs> she is currently working on a biography of Eunice Kennedy Shriver. And speaking of Mrs. Shriver, the last time she spoke here, Rosemary was very much on her mind. And I thought it might be appropriate to share a brief excerpt of her remarks as part of this introduction. You will not be surprised to know that I believe that those same qualities were also the experience that shaped President Kennedy. Truthfully, I believe Rosemary's rejection <coughs> had far more to go with the brilliance of his presidency than anyone can understand. Yes, he was our country's greatest champion <clears throat> of what we all call mental retardation. To this day, his legacy of innovation in treating NICHD, the University Affiliated Centers, the President's Council remains today one of the great histories of our country. But beyond the work he did for people with intellectual disabilities, I believe it was Rosemary's influence <coughs> that centralized him and all of us 
to the gift to the gifts of vulnerable and, and weak people. I think I can say that not one among the thousands who have written about him has understood what it is really like to be a brother of a person who has mental retardation. And tonight I want to say that, <clears throat> that I've never said before, more than any single individual, Rosemary had the greatest influence. The new book concludes by describing the work of various members of the Shriver family to whom Mrs. Shriver passed her torch. Tim, the CEO of Special Olympics, echoes his mother's observation, suggesting that Rosemary belongs at the center of the Kennedy family story because her siblings were touched by witnessing her early struggles and the tragic turn in her life's trajectory. One can still picture Rosemary in those years in England when the world was most kind to her reading Christopher Robin's words to his friend Pooh. Quote, promise me you'll always remember you're braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. Due to circumstances beyond her control, Rosemary Kennedy lived a diminished life. Yet we live in an age that is more fully sensitized to the bravery and strength of the vulnerable among us. And for that, may Rosemary Kennedy always be remembered. Please join me now in welcoming Kate Clifford Larson and Eileen McNamara to our stage. Well, thank you all. We are feedbacking here. I don't know if that's okay. Oh, it's there. Oh, it's that. Um, so, Kate, could you have picked a more challenging topic? You, uh, you have a woman who disappeared from public view in 1941 when she was only 23 years old. Where does a biographer even begin? And more importantly, maybe why? You know, that those are two great questions. Um, why is easier to answer. Um, back in 2005, I saw Rosemary's obituary in the newspaper, and it was like a three-paragraph obituary in the Boston Globe. And for some reason, it just hit me. I had been vaguely aware of Rosemary, and of course, I was very aware of the Kennedy family having grown up in New England. And I just, I just thought, oh, this life, you know, what happened to her? And as a women's historian, you know, my antenna went up right away, like, why don't we know more about her? So I tucked it in the back of my mind, and I was working on another book project, but I just had this sense that I should investigate her life and that might be my next project. Mm -hmm. So when I did start researching her life, it might have been a little bit of naivete, naivete on my part, thinking I'd be able to unearth all this information and it won't be any problem and I could write about this beautiful young woman and you know about what happened to her. Uh, the process took a lot longer than I thought because the record was you know, a little bit spotty. But over the years, more and more papers became available, so it made it easier. But it is a challenge to write about somebody who disappears and who leaves few papers behind, but it is possible. Tell us what you think about Rosemary's life before the lobotomy in 1941. Um, was she a happy child? Was, uh, was she integrated into the life of that family? Um, Rosemary was an adorable child, happy, um, but also she struggled and suffered in trying to compete with her much more capable siblings. Uh, she was integrated into the family when she was home and her siblings did a great job trying to accommodate her disabilities. They um, would play sports with her. Uh, they would go sailing with her and they would um, take the helm but help her be part of that sailing. And tennis, all the sports activities that they were all capable of doing by themselves, she needed help but they accommodated her. Which of course influenced uh, Eunice as an adult to start the Special Olympics. She knew that sports was an important aspect for every human being but uh, also for people with, with disabilities. And so she was happy on the one hand. On the other hand, um, she was very unhappy because of the struggles that she faced. And her parents also sent her off to many different schools over a period of 10 years. And that was very hard on a, on a young child, uh, teenager, young adult woman who was constantly separated from her family 
who she loved very, very much and wanted to be with. So her life had bright moments, but also a lot of struggles. And she was only 11, I think, from reading your book, when she went to the first boarding school that they sent her to in Pennsylvania, if I'm, if I'm correct. So she never did adjust very well when she had these big transitions in her life. And she never stayed at these schools very long, it seems. Did it not occur to her parents at some point that maybe this approach wasn't working for her? Um, it's not clear whether they understood that this bouncing her from one school to the next was actually harming her. I, I think they tried really hard to find a place where she could learn and um, be safe and uh, achieve things that they expected her to achieve. Um, and when those schools didn't seem to perform for them, they didn't, uh, they didn't wait, they just put her in another school. And that's unfortunate. And, and she suffered tremendously from the transitions from school to school. In some ways, that means to me that they treated her a lot like they treated their other children. Because Teddy went to a dozen schools, I think, and all the children moved. When Rose would move down to the Florida for the winter, she would pull the kids out of school and then put them in school down there. So it must have been just standard operating procedure. It was partly standard operating procedure, um, but also with Rosemary, she needed more time to make adjustments, and that was very unfair to her. And that was clear after the first transitions of a couple of different schools. Mm -hmm. And so it's unfortunate that uh, Rose and Joe didn't take a step back and say, maybe we should pause here before we send her to a different school. They also had unrealistic expectations of her, and they expected that she would perform better in these schools, and she just couldn't. She was not capable, and at the time, most schools could not provide um, appropriate kind of educational programming for people with disabilities like Rosemary had. So um, they just were determined that they were gonna cure her, and that, those were her, their words, cure her of her disabilities when in fact we know that's not possible. In fact, maybe that delusion and maybe that approach sort of explains a little bit her, she was a fairly high functioning young woman, wasn't she? I mean, she was. She was presented to the King and Queen of England as a debutante. Right. Um, she achieved, I would say, about a fourth grade education level. Uh, her maturity level was probably about the same. Um, it's hard to say because I never met her in person, but given what she writes in the letters that are here at the Kennedy Library, you can see that her emotional level is, is um, you know, quite immature. Um, but she, uh, she could function, and today she certainly would be mainstreamed in classrooms um, and as an adult, perhaps even live independently with uh, resources and support systems. Um, but in those days, none of that was available. And that stigma, does that stigma explain some of the duplicity a little that you describe in the book where um, Rose and Joe didn't exactly uh, reveal everything about Rosemary's abilities when they put her in one school or another school? They sort of suggested that she was higher functioning than she was. Right. The first school they sent her away to uh, when she was 11 years old was the Devereux School in Pennsylvania. And that was a specific school uh, created for uh, children with intellectual disabilities. And the uh, woman who ran the school was very successful with other students. But because the Kennedys believed that Rosemary could be cured, they really were not willing to accept that label that she had disabilities. They were not pleased with her progress there. So they moved her to other schools uh, traditional schools, and um, she could not keep up with classmates. Even though she might be put in a classroom with other eighth graders, let's say, she still could only perform at a fourth grade level. And the, the Kennedys, Joe and Rose, did not inform most of the teachers that this was actually what was going on with Rosemary. So they had expectations, the teachers had expectations of Rosemary, her parents did, and Rosemary could not meet those expectations. So they were duplicitous, and I don't, I don't know how they thought these teachers were going to perform some miracle on Rosemary, particularly after they go through two, three more schools and things are not changing. So it seemed more like they just wanted Rosemary sent away somewhere rather than really trying to find an appropriate educational setting.
was her progress complicated too by uh, n the family either not recognizing or not wanting to acknowledge that this wasn't simply a case of intellectual disabilities. You make wonderful use of the primary sources here at the library where you quote teachers who talk about her belligerence, her uh, acting out. Uh, it, it seems that there was mental illness combined with intellectual disability. Uh, as Rosemary aged into her teen years and young adulthood, it became apparent that there was more going on than just simply uh, a young person's frustrations at being um, uh, having expectations they can't meet. As many people have intellectual disabilities do have frustrations and they do lash out. But things that were going on with Rosemary indicate that perhaps there were some mental health issues emerging when she was in her teen years. And certainly as a young adult woman, um, mental illness uh, began to appear in Rosemary and her parents um, clearly were not sure what they should do about that other than quiet her, silence her. And she never really received mental health treatment, did she? I mean, all of these efforts were designed to improve her academic performance. It doesn't sound like there was much of an effort made to deal with her emotional problems. Uh, no, and of course, uh, you brought up the issue of stigma. First of all, there was a stigma, stigma attached to having a child with intellectual disabilities. There were horrific phrases that they used at the time period, like moron and imbecile and Rose and Joe. You know, here they have this beautiful daughter, and they certainly don't want those labels placed on their daughter. So they thought they could shift her away and, and hide those disabilities. But when it came to mental illness, they weren't equipped to deal with it, and, and frankly, neither was the medical establishment as well. Um, people were warehoused in horrific institutions, people who had mental illness. And uh, for Rosemary, there, you know, there really weren't medications except for maybe a barbiturate that would have put her to sleep or calmed her down. So there were very few resources. Um, Rose and Joe were smart enough to know that there might be mental health issues going on with Rosemary because they did investigate um, placing her in a psychiatric, psychiatric institution um, in the fall of 1941, and those records are here in the library. They ended up not doing that. I'm not clear why, but um, they were aware, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that she had some uh, mental he uh, health issues. It's yeah. interesting because, as you say, the options weren't that many in the 40s. It wasn't until the late 50s that we start getting psychotropic drugs that can help people with mental illness. Right. Um, and so lobotomies perhaps seem like a logical choice, although it may sound horrific to us today. So it is horrific, and um, I feel, <clears throat> feel pretty strongly that it, was, it didn't necessarily look like the best option. At the time that Joe Kennedy started investigating lobotomies, they were being done by a pair of uh, doctors in Washington, D.C., Walter Freeman and James Watts. And they were basically experimenting. It was very rarely done across the world, and they had operated on fewer than 100 patients by the time they um, performed the lobotomy on Rosemary. And the American Medical Association was clear that spring and summer, they reported that they felt that it was too experimental, the side effects were too um, dramatic, and that lobotomies needed to be researched more before they continued performing them on live patients. Joe was a really smart man. He would have known that. He would have had that resource. He would have known that the American Medical Association was uh, not recommending it. But he went ahead to, and had her lobotomized anyway. Why? I, uh, I think he felt he needed to um, silence her in a way and um, make her more, as, as the doctors would have told him, more compliant, more pliable, um, uh, less emotional. Mm -hmm. um, and what and were the consequences of that lobotomy for Rosemary? So the best case scenario would have been that she would have been sort of devoid of feeling and pliable and compliant. But that rarely happened. For Rosemary, she became completely disabled, physically um, and intellectually disabled. She left that operation not being able to walk or talk. Um, she had a permanent uh, physical disability as a result of the lobotomy. 
She regained the ability to speak a few words, um, a few phrases, and uh, she could never take care of herself uh, again for the rest of her life. Which leads to the question that's really bothered everybody who's heard this story since they read Doris Kearns Goodwin's book in 1988, when Rose told her that um, she didn't see her daughter for 20 years after this lobotomy. How could that be? And why? I wish I had an answer. As a mother, I cannot imagine not seeing my child for 20 years. Um, I think perhaps um, Rose always looked forward her whole life. She had many disappointments, but she was committed to looking forward, and she looked to her faith to guide her and move forward. And I think she did with this instance as well. Rosemary was going to be institutionalized, and so she didn't need to see her daughter anymore, and she would concentrate on the rest of her children. However, I, I still... You know, it's all well and good to say that, but really, how do you not see your child for 20 years? I, I, I can't get my head around that. I really can't. And Joe, of course, m maybe saw her for a couple of years, and then he stopped visiting her as well. And that is remarkable to me, because Rosemary was still cognizant. She knew her family. She remembered her siblings. She knew her parents, but she didn't see them. And she comes back into their lives in the early 70s. We start seeing Eunice go out to visit her and bring her back. Joe was dead by then. Right. So was the death of the ambassador like a precipitating uh, act that brought her back into the family? Um, I think that was part of it. I think um, Eunice um, did a tremendous amount of work um, uh, bringing out the story of Rosemary, who had intellectual disabilities after the president um, had been elected, her brother Jack had been elected. So during the 1960s, the public was becoming more and more used to having conversations about people with disability, intellectual disabilities, so they could talk about Rosemary more. And once um, the ambassador died in 1969, I think Rose, who was becoming quite elderly herself, now had more time to reconnect with her daughter and to reintegrate Rosemary into the family. I think the Shrivers had been spending time with Rosemary during the late 60s anyway, but by the 1970s, Rosemary started making trips to Hyannisport and Palm Beach and was spending more time with her siblings and her nieces and nephews that she was meeting for the first time, and they were getting to know her, and certainly they became inspired by her. Yeah. You tell a uh, really poignant and sad story in the book about uh, Rosemary's first encounter with her mother after those 20 years. Do you want to recount sure. it for the audience? Um, so this comes from one of the sisters um, in the, uh, at St. Coletta's in Jefferson, Wisconsin, where Rosemary spent the last 50 years of her life. Um, and she recoiled when she saw her mother for the first time. She knew who her mother was. She knew that she hadn't seen her mother. Did she blame her mother for the lobotomy? I'm not really sure. Did she blame her father? Not really sure. That hasn't been recorded, but certainly pain and anger and anguish were part of her lived experience, and that all came flooding back to her when she saw her mother. Well, you know, that runs so counter to the pop, in the popular imagination, how we think of Rose Kennedy. The narrative has always been of this uh, doting mother uh, who hovers above her children. Uh, was that your experience in your research of Rose Kennedy? Uh, well, she hovered in, in a certain way. Certainly, um, she viewed herself as a very professional mother, um, and uh, she looked to um, uh, the Catholic faith to guide her in being a mother, and that she would be at home and she would train her children to be good citizens and good Catholics and good people, and that was her mission. And I think she did do that. They were good people, good Catholics, um, I didn't see her to, as a very a terribly warm person. Uh, Joe, their father, was definitely much more demonstrative um, emotionally with his children than Rose was. Um, so she, you know, she was very um, cold and um, in some ways, I mean, she loved her children, certainly, but she had a way about her that was not very warm and cuddly. 
Um, she was dedicated to Rosemary. I mean, friends of theirs in testimony to other historians um, who have written about the family talked about the amount of time that Rose spent with Rosemary when she was a child, helping her with her schoolwork, working with her you know, on the tennis court and spending a lot more time with her than she did with the other children. So, um, you know, there's that side of Rose that she had this sort of job that she wanted to do and she wanted to provide the best for her children. And so she did that in the best way that she could. Um, but she also wanted her own life and she would spend months at a time traveling around Europe and, and leave the children with, um, you know, governesses and nurses and and uh, the, the, the letters that Rosemary writes home, and you can see them here in the library, are heartbreaking. She misses her mother, and she misses her father and her siblings, and she, you know, it's like, I'm trying so hard. If I'm good, can I come home? And this is actually one of the really sad parts of the schools that she was sent to, particularly the one that, um, that uh, was a school for intellectually disabled. They used um, behavior and doing well in school as a sort of a ticket home. So if Rosemary did well and if she behaved well, then she could go home for Thanksgiving. If she didn't, then she couldn't. Now for 11 year old girl, I can't imagine that kind of um, requirement. And you know, she, was, she wrote a series of letters home. Uh, I'm trying to be good, are you sure? I wanna come home for Thanksgiving and, and you know, please will you tell um, Mrs. Devereaux, that I can come home for Thanksgiving. It's just, it, excuse me, it's just heartbreaking, heartbreaking. You do have a sense in those letters. I mean, and she writes to her siblings as well. And of just a desperately lonely little girl who wanted nothing more than to be part of this big, obstreperous family. Right. It, she may have been overwhelmed by them, but right. she clearly missed them. She missed them. And um, she also had a sense that she was the older sister. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, she's um, immature and not quite as capable as her younger sister, Kathleen Kick and Eunice. Um, so she sort of talks to them in a in sort of a very childlike way. At the same time, she's aware she's the older sister. And she says to them, now, I want you to write me a letter you be a good girl and write. And so there's this, you know, she has this conflicting thing going on. And, but it's so adorable. It is just so precious. It really is amazing. Poignant and poignant. Yes, very um, poignant. And after the surgery, tell us about the woman that emerges. I mean, those first 10 years are obviously very difficult years because she doesn't have the rehabilitation that she gets later on in her life. Right. Uh, once she's at St. Coletta's and there are people working with her, there are physical therapists, she gets some language back. Tell us about what her life was like there. Um, I think it was much happier there. We have really no records to speak of of what happened to her um, at Craig House. It was a psychiatric hospital north of New York City where she was sent after she healed from the lobotomy. So probably in 1942, several months after her surgery, she was sent to Craig House which was not really equipped to help um, a disabled person like Rosemary regain uh, her abilities. <clears throat> so she ended up at St. Coletta's and those nuns were remarkable. Um, they helped her regain some speech. Uh, she exercised every day. Uh, Rose ended up paying for a pool through uh, Rosemary's trust fund to build a pool um, so that she could go swimming every day. And interestingly, um, in one of the records, uh, one of the sisters talks about how they stopped giving Rosemary medication that she had been taking for a very long time. And all of a sudden, Rosemary started talking. So obviously, they had been over-medicating her probably mm -hmm. from the Craig House years. And, um, but it took the sisters at St. Coletta's and some of the uh, physicians that they were working with to recognize that maybe Rosemary didn't need these sedating um, medicines mm -hmm. anymore or as much and she kind of blossomed after that and she the Kennedys built her her own little cottage on the grounds at St. Coletta's That's right she, she had a dog she had a dog and a, a bird um, and so she had a full life she loved to go shopping the nuns would take her into town and they would go shopping uh, Joe provided a car um, and the nuns would drive Rosemary in the car into town and and, um, and she had friends at St. Coletta's. There were a couple of uh, women that were there that they spent, she spent time with every single day. 
So she had friendships and um, she had a routine that she was used to and, and happy with. And in fact, I think she was so happy in, a, in, in that context that when she started making the visits to uh, Hyannisport and Palm Beach, they were very disruptive for her and it was a very difficult time. Not only was she resentful towards her mother, but that transition to an unfamiliar place um, was very hard on her. So it probably wasn't always the best Rosemary who appeared in those um, instances. And those visits continued. Eunice continued to bring her out, right, until yes. the end of her life. Yes, exactly. She would attend spe Special Olympics events. Um, you know, there were uh, pictures of her, you know, and Hyannis and, and also Palm Beach, mm -hmm. going to church, things like that. So th part of this um, story resonates with you. Yeah, it does. Um, you were attracted to her story because of some of your own personal experiences. Right. Are you comfortable sharing sure. those with us? Um, when I started researching this in 2008, I was researching it because I'm a women's historian and I was fascinated by the story. But a couple of years into the research, my son was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And all of a sudden, I was thrown in, my husband and I were thrown into this world of having to take care of a child with a very serious disability, a very serious mental illness. And what parents go through and what you need to do and what you want to do for your child. So I got a slightly different perspective on Rose and Joe. So I'm a, I became a little bit more harsh in my my um, opinion of them. On the other hand, I became also more sympathetic. Um, it's a lot of hard work to have a child with disabilities. Um, the Kennedys had a tremendous amount of money. They could have used those resources even more so to take care of Rosemary. And even today, if, if this happened to a young woman um, with a family like that, with those resources, there are uh, ways to take care of someone with severe mental illness. But for the average family who doesn't have the money, the resources are not there. And it is a, we've done a lot for people with intellectual disabilities and physical disabilities. Our nation has not done enough for people with mental illness and the families that love them. And I think it's true, isn't it, that um, we've come so far in dealing with intellectual disabilities that the stigma isn't as great right. as, it, as it once was. Right. And even when uh, Mrs. Shriver wrote the Saturday Evening Post piece in 1962, which basically revealed to the world that Rosemary had intellectual disabilities, that piece does not talk about the mental illness piece. Yeah. There's no mention of it. Right. And I don't think the family ever really looks at it that way, except Patrick Kennedy, who recently came out with his, his own personal story and that of the family. And he does say in his book that clearly uh, Rosemary had mental illness, and, um, but the family would never talk about that. And he wants his family to talk about that. I want the whole country to start talking about it, because we need to have that conversation. We need to get rid of that stigma. And I think the Kennedy family is still living with the fears of that stigma, but we should not, we should all be talking about this and, and find ways to provide more resources. So you began this journey as a professional historian, right, right. wanting to tell a woman's story, right. and you wound up with a cause. Yeah, exactly, exactly, right, thanks right. to Rosemary, right. who obviously has, yeah, that's her legacy, that she has given many of the Kennedys today a cause, um, and for me, she's, She's giving me this platform as well. And I had an interview the other day um, on WBUR, and uh, Lisa Mullins said, Rosemary was a muse. Well, what a beautiful way to describe Rosemary. She was a muse for her family, her siblings, who went on to really affect a tremendous amount of change for people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully she'll continue to be a muse. Should we open it up to our audience? Would you like that questions? Kate would be um, happy to take your questions if you have some, so don't be shy. Yes, sir. Hi, how are you? Um, I was curious what happened to the two physicians. Did Joe ever go after them, or did he just ignore the fact that they had butchered his daughter? <clears throat> we have no idea. The records are, are not available because they're medical records, so those are closed. and. Um, even records that aren't completely medical records are, have disappeared. They're, you know, at George Washington University, um, they're just not there, so we have no idea. I didn't find a lawsuit or anything like that, so 
I, he so, did not, at least publicly or even through the courts, he didn't do anything. So they continued to do lobotomies. Uh, James Watts and uh, Walter Freeman continued working together for several more years, and then Freeman went off and he became the famous lobotomist, and he developed the ice pick lobotomy uh, procedure, then, and he lobotomized thousands of people, thousands of and them. Just to Thank give you. us some historical context, um, lobotomies were performed routinely, right, through the 50s. Through the 50s. And um, the man who originated the lobotomy w won a Nobel Prize in 1949. Yeah. So we look back at horror at what happened to Rosemary, but people thought it was going to be the miracle cure in the 40s. Right. Um, and when I did my research on lobotomies, there were a couple of interesting things about it. Um, one is that uh, there were some successes, but when I looked at the research of Freeman and Watts, and they also had another doctor they worked with, Thelma Hunt, um, they were touting the success of this operation that the great majority of the patients were much better off. But actually, when you looked at their research, the great majority were far worse off many had died or were completely crippled like Rosemary. So they weren't truthful in their work. They, they lied. And then uh, as lobotomies became more popular, um, I discovered that between 60 and 80 percent of the patients were women when, only, when women were only 40 percent of psychiatric admissions. So more women were, were subjected to this operation than men. And of course, in those days, there were no patient protections and a father, brother, husband could you know, have this done to their, their loved ones very easily without imagine a recourse. Imagine somebody wanting to silence women. I just yeah. can't imagine. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> yes. Hi, my, my name is Carolyn Clark. I'm a docent here at the Kennedy Library. Patrick recently publicly said that his family was, was very disturbed about the appearance of his book. I was wondering what the response was in the family to your book. Um, I have heard uh, nothing. Simple. Nothing. 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 Interesting. Yes, sir. Uh, can you speak to the circumstances of Rosemary's birth? Absolutely. Um, I open the book with um, the circumstances of Rosemary's birth. It was September of 1918, and the Spanish influenza had already made a sweep around the globe and killed millions of people, and it was making a second pass around the globe, and it was hitting Boston in September of 1918, and thousands of people had died, and thousands more were in the hospitals. Um, Rose's obstetrician or doctor at the time, was busy at a hospital when she went into labor. She had a nurse with her uh, to help monitor and keep her calm and get her ready. But Rose, Rose's labor became fast and furious, and she wanted to deliver that baby, but the obstetrician wasn't there. And the nurse, who had been trained how to deliver a baby, um, requested that Rose hold that baby back because the priority, even though the nurse had been trained, was to wait for the doctor to come and deliver that child. Well, of course, Rose couldn't hold the baby back. You just can't do that. So the nurse held baby Rosemary back in the birth canal. Um, so clearly, she, and it was for apparently a couple of hours. So uh, baby Rosemary was deprived of oxygen. That certainly would have contributed to her intellectual disabilities. Women. <laughs> Poor women. Um, yeah. yeah, I think you've left them breathless. Uh, you know, that raises a question for me is, um, you know, we as historians, you can look back and, and perhaps that's what happened. But how do we know? We don't know for sure, but we know that did happen. So. So, and it, you know, yeah. right. You have said that the families had no reaction that you're aware of to the book. Could you share um, any members of the family that you may have spoken with? Did you speak with Ambassador Smith, who would have lived through those years you're detailing alongside her sister and only si and yeah, as the only surviving sibling, or any other family members? I, I did speak to the Shrivers. Timothy and Anthony uh, were very gracious, and um, and actually I had several conversations with Anthony Shriver, who provided a couple of the photographs for the book of Rosemary as a disabled adult. Um, he was incredibly gracious. Um, I spoke to a couple of distant cous cousins, uh, Charlie Burke on the Cape, 
Um, and I reached out to the ambassador, but um, no response. Um, from what I understand from the Shrivers and others is that the gener younger generations know nothing about what happened to Rosemary. And uh, in fact, Anthony had said to me that, um, that they didn't know what happened to Rosemary and perhaps I could find out and let them know. So I certainly was able to, to find out some things that happened to Rosemary. Actually, it's a rich story that I was able to uncover. Um, and Patrick Kennedy recently came out and said his family never talked about any of these quote unquote secrets. He grew up not knowing anything about not only Rosemary, but his own father and, and other people. So it's not surprising that the younger generations have no knowledge. And Jean, of course, was, um, she was a teenager, maybe 13, 14 years old, when uh, Rosemary disappeared from the family. So, and uh, Rose, oh yes, absolutely, uh, uh, Rosemary. Absolutely, the whole family was transformed um, because of Rosemary. There's no question about that. Jack and Eunice and, and Senator Kennedy and uh, Bobby, all of them and their wives. It, it's very clear. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's Rosemary's legacy. If there is a tragedy, there's also this incredible outcome, the way that they were able to affect change for millions of people around this country and around the world. Yeah. Yes. Um, do they still perform that procedure, and have they replaced it with something else that's similar? Um, lobotomies are very, very rarely performed today. I think they use lasers, in fact, today. I, don't quote me on that, but I think yeah. they do. And there are several states where it's illegal. Yeah, I think yeah. most across the country. And so um, if uh, there are certain cases where it is recommended, and according to laws and medical um, boards, there has to be a specific patient board and a medical board that has to review the case. The hospital has to donate the time and the services, the equipment. The doctor has to donate his time. And no one gets paid for it. It's only used in extreme cases. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to a, a friend who's a neurosurgeon, and he has done it twice. I think he said twice in his career. And it was for people who had been institutionalized basically in straitjackets for their li whole lives in psychiatric hospitals. And this particular surgery is incredibly effective for a particular type of mental illness. And so the two patients he told me about were able to uh, leave the psychiatric hospital, um, get a high school, college, master's degrees, and live independent lives. So it does happen, but it's with great, great um, care and um, it's not very often. The president did assign Eunice as special needs because of uh, Rosemary, because he knew that she and the family were, that was like presented when she oh. became head of special needs. And I, 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 Eileen would probably know more about this than me, but yeah. I think Eunice got President Kennedy yeah. to I think <laughs> yeah. I think we get that a little back. Yeah. I think yeah. Eunice got the president yeah. Yeah. to pay attention to this issue. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Kate, I'd like to salute your beautiful, fantastic book. Thank you. And what besides uh, the problem with Rosemary this could be a make awareness of this book to many other problems in the United States with disability. So I respect and thank you so much, Kate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, if there isn't anything else, no other questions, then we are thrilled that you came, delighted that you participated, and um, our author will be outside signing books for you. Thank you, Eileen. <laughs>